Technology in the classroom is just a tool, another tool, for students to express their ideas and creativity. Um, just like a painters, painters have paints, um, in the, techno the technology can be used to help students just express their own ideas. Um, it can also be a great opportunity for students to develop fluency um, using an area of strength, in an area of strength, um, that they can use outside of that area of strength. So when a student uses Photoshop in an art classroom and they navigate that incredibly sophisticated program, they're more comfortable with a computer interface, they're using their executive function skills, but then when they transition to an English classroom where they use that technology to hear books and they use a computer to hear books or they use a computer to um, help them express their ideas with voice to text, um, they're more comfortable with the computer as a bridge between them and expressing their ideas. Just like any other past generation, um, there is always something that really this generation is really passionate about. Um, and I guess just broad strokes, uh, this generation is really passionate about um, being social um, and being social with technology. So social media and phones and computers and iPads is something that really captivates um, their attention. It's really, you know, who are you friends with on social media? Who are you following? How did you get this picture? How do, can I make this video? Um, and so since they're really excited about producing for the first time, um, and consuming, um, that makes it a really exciting time for us as teachers because all of a sudden they want to do work. Um, they, if you frame it that way for yourself as a teacher and realize like, oh, they want to take pictures and spend time editing and adding video and sound, um, that's a lot of, iter of an iteration process and reviewing and editing, and that's kind of what we've been trying to teach them <laughs> uh, for hundreds of years, right? Write a paper, edit it, read it over again, do it again, and they want to just do it in a different medium. They are so excited to show you because to them, this is something that they're finally good at. And maybe you already know how to use um, some sort of technology. You may, might already know how to put a reminder on your phone, but have a student show you because then you know that that student knows how to do it. You can sort of see how they're using the technology and it reinforces the trust between you and the student hey, I trust you to show me this technology. You are, you are a trusted member of our community and it's sort of building that trust. Don't let the expensive part deter you because so many of the things that are available are already in, in your classroom and you don't even know it. And don't be so scared because you might actually learn an incredible amount um, about how your students' brains are working. They're actually sitting there waiting for you to come to them and be like, hey, how can we better access this? Um, I think that go to the kids. They know, they know what they like and they're typically very helpful. Text-to-speech and speech-to-text are tools that um, any student can use, but there are some students that need to use those tools and that's where those types of tools really become assistive technology. They enable them to do something that they can't otherwise do without those tools. I also work with a, a student who uh, she really struggles with math. It is, she just thinks math is the worst thing on the entire planet. She doesn't understand it at all. But something that has really helped her are, are those apps that we, we discussed earlier. Um, that, the, one, the calculator that speaks to her has really helped her understand, oh my gosh, I'm flipping my numbers constantly. Um, and the one that scripts uh, where she can write on her iPad um, has given both me and her math teacher a much better insight into, wow, I can see where the problem is as it, okay, you just got the wrong answer. I don't know how you got the answer was supposed to be 91 and you got 18 and I have no idea how you got here. We can sort of see a much better process um, and so we're adapting her entire curriculum um, because of that. She's actually in her own specialized class. Um, so that's been cool to see her progress and realizing we're really trying to work with her. Um, I think for that particular student she really recognizes like I am getting, I am getting different technologies that other kids might not be 
And that is because I am different. Um, and she's sort of really taken ownership of that. Like I get this because I need help and I want to use it, um, which has been really cool. I've also seen um, a student who was really low confidence in his writing last year, but once he learned that he could speak his papers and, and basically just not type at all, he didn't have to take that extra step of indenting and all that, just get out his, all of his thoughts, um, his English scores soared. Um, and that was a really cool process to see him go from, I hate writing, I hate English, to now wanting to write longer papers and you know, and submitting papers to us being like, hey, did you see this paper that I wrote about Hiroshima? And you're like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Um, so that's been really cool to see. I think kids gain confidence when we give them the right technology. And that is something that I can't teach. So that is something I'm very grateful for. Everybody has to take an art class, and 75% of those students are not necessarily going to have careers in the arts. What they can get from the arts is those executive function skills that they might not develop as readily in a language-based classroom, because our students struggle with language-based learning differences. In the visual arts, our students are able to use those same processes that we want students to have, those habits of mind, those goal-oriented behaviors, where they're envisioning long-term sophisticated projects, um, and they're working through iterations to achieve their goals, where they're editing and they're rethinking information. Um, one of the things that happens in the arts is that our iterations tend to be concrete. Um, so when you create a small version, you still have that small version in front of you as you're working toward your finished piece. Having that small version really offloads working memory. So for somebody who's struggling with working memory or for somebody who struggles with language, having that visual prompt in front of them can really facilitate and scaffold those executive function skills so they can still express really sophisticated skills like self-assessment, inhibition, um, figuring out if what they're doing is getting them toward their goal, and planning and strategizing to move forward. It's um, a part of our everyday world now. I mean, you can push um, your text on your phone and have it read aloud to you so that when you're driving, um, you're not distracted from that and you can hear something read. Uh, so it's a, it's a tool that's really quite ubiquitous now, but it's really um, powerful for students um, who are struggling with reading um, to be able to give them access to more complex text, to give them access to grade level text that they might not be able to um, either decode or comprehend um, in written format on their own. We are encouraging children to use audiobooks um, as a supplement, but also as a replacement for reading. Um, at this point, if you are 14, 15, 16 years old and you are still having massive problems decoding words, that could be that you are struggling with just individual words, but often at this level, it means that you cannot read as fast as your peers, and therefore it would take you so much longer. Um, so if we haven't been able to sort of, I don't wanna say solve that problem, but just give you the tools to, to, to read efficiently, then we need to find a more efficient way for you in order to survive in the real world. And so audiobooks are a great way um, to do that. Our kids are completely different. Every child has a very different learning profile. So I'll have one kid who can listen to the audiobook, and he is also reading along. He is capable of doing that, making notes in the margins, absolutely 100%. I have a completely different child who she is not able to do that. To her, listening and trying to decode at the same time is just sensory overload. So she doesn't even, we don't even give her a print copy. Um, she listens and she takes her own notes as it goes along. Um, a third student might be having the book out just kind of as a safety mechanism for maybe I heard a word that I didn't understand and I know it's here. Um, and so I'm hearing it, circling it there, and he needs to stop the audio and then brain dump. Like, okay, what did I just hear? I know that it's in between pages six and eight, and I don't know where exactly it is, but I'm just gonna put my notes here. So all of those are really great strategies because in all of those examples, they are able to show their hopefully future professors or um, bosses, like I am doing the work, here is the evidence of it. It's just that I'm getting the information in a different way. Um, and that's really what we're trying to show them. Like, 
you are different, so the way that you are going to be accessing information is going to be different, but it doesn't mean you're not working really hard and getting exactly the same comprehension skills. For the most part, our kids are very intelligent. Um, their comprehension is phenomenal. It's just how to access that, that point. Um, so we, are, we like to think of it as we're not giving them anything extra, we're just giving them finally the way to learn that they've been looking for. We have students who are different learners who are actually um, incredibly savvy in finding new ways to use old technologies to support their learning differences, but then often it goes beyond that. I had a student last year who, um, instead of drawing his hand in my class, which is a very simple task, asked if he could build a telephoto pinhole lens for his camera. And the answer was, of course, yes. And he created these incredible light paintings. Um, but part of his fearlessness was the fact that he was a student who really struggled with reading um, and had been using technology to assist him uh, ever since he was little. So he developed with those technologies and he developed those skills and strengths alongside of supporting his areas of growth. Another uh, platform that's becoming really popular overall across all schools I think is having a learning management system essentially um, where teachers can upload all of their worksheets, all of their videos maybe from class or their PowerPoints um, and so students can access those at any time so that if you lost your notes <laughs> they have magically disappeared out of your backpack um, you know that you can go and get a teacher version of those notes and that you're not completely sunk just because you had a bad backpack day or your binder exploded in the hallway, which is an ongoing event. Those strategies make the students feel more at ease with, with accepting the fact that sometimes I'm just going to lose this piece of paper and that is going to be okay because I'm going to figure out a way to get the piece of paper back somehow retrieve that information that I have now lost. I think because technology is so integrated into their lives, it's an easy solution um, to show them how to use it for their organizational life. Um, and so that could be as simple as telling them, hey, why don't you use Siri or WordCue uh, to remind yourself that you have to do a worksheet tonight. So go ahead and speak into your phone, let yourself know, set a reminder for 5 p.m. math worksheet. Technology really becomes not only um, providing access for students to become writers as far as overcoming physical um, or learning challenges, but there's that engagement piece. Um, and so when we take away some of those barriers, um, they become more engaged. There are things that absolutely make writing fun. When you tell a student that you need to write a three paragraph essay, that can be really intimidating. When you instead tell them that they need to create um, a three-panel graphic novel, um, that becomes a lot more fun. Um, and so using tools like comic book creator um, resources out there where they are combining graphics and speech bubbles and text together and then they see themselves as an author just like some of their favorite authors that are out there who are writing graphic novels. We get students after they've had eight years of academic challenge. So often they come to us believing that they cannot learn. Um, because our students have been smart enough to make it through eight years without anybody realizing that they were having difficulty, often they are incredibly creative, savvy, intelligent students. All we have to do in the arts is find a place where they can succeed and develop some confidence. And once they start to get traction in terms of learning that they can actually learn something new, we are then able to really maximize and, and leverage that newfound excitement um, and set them free so that they can work as hard as we possibly can push them um, in the arts. And so they really do develop a tremendous amount of self-esteem. Many of our students think of themselves as creative thinkers and understand that their unique perspective, where it might be challenging in high school, is actually going to be a strength for them as they transition into the work world.
So teachers that are looking for resources to learn about how to use assistive technology um, or access technology that they may already have in their classrooms to support students who are struggling or who are learning differently, there's a range of resources that are out there. One of my favorite resources um, is the Center on Technology and Disability. And there is a range of archived and live webcasts available on all um, sorts of assistive technology topics, um, from universal design for learning, to technology for early childhood, to technology for students who are transitioning out of schools. Um, there's many articles and videos that are available there as well for teachers to learn at their own pace um, and to take advantage of that just-in-time learning when they need it. Um, because sometimes when we go to something and learn about it, we don't have the opportunity to, um, to use it right away. It's not as useful as when I can go on, search for the topic that I need information on right now, and access it. The center also has a, a large number of resources for families to take advantage of. There's the family guide and an AT glossary that are available as part of the family portal um, on the Center for Technology and Disability. I would also recommend that um, teachers take advantage of Twitter um, to be able to develop a personal learning network. Um, they can follow um, AT Chat um, to be able to have um, at the um, ready a whole host of um, experts to ask questions to, um, and, and so that's just one of many. Um, there's also LD Chat um, that's through understood.org. Uh, so many, many resources that are available to teachers um, to be able to get bite-sized chunks of learning um, just when they need it.